So you would try and take the compound, manipulate it to give maximum anabolic outcomes with a relative lack of androgenic outcomes to create something that men, women, children, anybody could take for muscle wasting purposes and preserve tissue. And they never successfully did it, but an array of compounds have come out. I don't really know the history at all of anabolic steroids. So I'm, I'm guessing like testosterone's probably been around since the 30s or 40s, right? Presumably. Yeah, I think when it was first synthesized, remains up for debate maybe but i know it was uh it, it goes back nearly 100 years at this point point. and so what was the first anabolic derivative of testosterone the first one i can think of off the top of my head is dianabol there might have been like methyl test or something but you know I'm, i could be misremembering but essentially what they did was they took the testosterone molecule and found they could finagle it and re you know manipulate it in ways to create testosterone derivatives like dianabol methandrostenolone which is you know supposedly the breakfast of champions according to arnold it's one of his famous quotes boldenone on uh is a very commonly used drug as well still it was prescribed to horses i believe for a while and then i don't think it ever had a human use but that is a testosterone derivative as well and there's other ones that came thereafter like halo testin which I think famously one of the presidents of the United States was on some aggressive dose of halo testin for, I, think, I forget what it was, maybe fertility or androgen therapy, but some of the protocols back then made almost no sense, but halo testin. And through there, they also found, oh, if we take the 5-alpha reduced DHT, testosterone converts to DHT, you would take that DHT molecule, you can manipulate it and create more anabolic compounds that are tissue selective like the idea of actually tweaking and modifying it to begin with came from the utility clinically to implement in muscle wasting in androgen sensitive individuals so you're not going to give a child testosterone who has you know like a burn patient you're not gonna give him tests because you might masculinize the hell out of a female child for example so you have to come up with novel alternatives that are going to be anti-catabolic, preserve tissue, keep somebody from wasting away in a state of, you know, fill in the blank without causing extreme um, viralization. So the kind of like arms race of creating the best anabolic agent was from numerous pharmaceutical companies and came an array of compounds that you know now to be, you know, the dianabols, the boldenones, and on the DHT derivative side, you had, you know, the uh, oxandrolones, one of the more refined, more recent although decades ago at this point um prima bolin also a very refined one it's uh, metanolone um proviron i think still used actually to interact with shbg it's probably one of the most potent drugs at binding shbg is misterolone but yeah the ideal scenario would be you're trying to segregate the anabolic from androgenic activity because testosterone is essentially equal at least based on rodent studies you would find an equal amount of anabolic activity in muscle relative to androgen like activity masculinization so you would try and take the compound manipulate it to give maximum anabolic outcomes with a relative lack of androgenic outcomes to create something that men women children anybody could take for muscle wasting purposes and preserve tissue and they never successfully did it um but an array of compounds have come out but if 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 sort of one to 10 it would be testosterone let's just make this a scale up so mm -hmm. five is testosterone sure. so it is halfway between completely anabolic and completely androgenic mm -hmm. dht would be closer to one right it's much sure. more androgenic than it is anabolic yep what what is the furthest example you have that's closest to 10 meaning the most anabolic prima bolin probably so one would think that that would be like the drug of choice if you're a bodybuilder right it often is too so typically men will take i'm not saying that's the only drug because it depends on what else you're trying to get because sometimes the side effects as absurd as it sounds are desired so with dianabol for example heavily water retentive so that could help like cushion your joints when you're doing heavy lifting for example if you have better leverages on like a I don't know, a max out, you're going to be better with more water retention around your muscle belly than if you were in your muscle belly than you would if you had like a dry compound that is not a substrate for aromatase and like prima bolin is extremely refined and specific in its action. Like it's like a pure like protein accretion compound with a relatively less burdensome androgenic profile. But the side effects of it, it doesn't interact with aromatase because it's a DHT derivative. 
So it's not a substrate for aromatase. It does not 5-alpha reduce into a bunch of different things too. So it's more predictable in its outcomes. But that's not always the desired outcome. Some people want to look cosmetically inflated with water. Some people want to lift more weight or prevent injury. And sometimes that water can be helpful. Depends on the person. But yeah, that's like skewing the furthest direction of anabolic relative to androgenic. You probably have like Primabol and Anavar. Yeah, and I remember... Um again, just sort of reading like Anavar also highly prized among athletes because- Technically, SARMs are actually even further if I was to give okay. the most extreme anabolic relative to- So let's talk about SARMs then. What are Tell, tell folks what those are. Okay, so selective androgen receptor modulators. Some people might be more familiar with SARMs, which are, you've talked about Clomid, Tamoxifen yep. on this podcast before. Selective estrogen receptor modulators. So these will interact in a tissue specific way with estrogen receptors in various areas of the body. So you might have, uh, you know, inhibition of estrogen receptor activity in the breast for somebody who has, you know, breast cancer, for example, versus you would have like pro estrogen activity in other areas of the body like bone, which is what makes the selective action of it desirable because you can actually sort of choose where you get the activity you want, but also don't impact the health of other tissues and other areas of the body. So the same idea was kind of adopted for SARMs and they tweaked and modified anti-androgens actually to make these compounds that would interact with the androgen receptor in a way that was tissue specific and try and get like pure anabolic activity with almost no androgenic and proportionally it's more successful probably than anabolic steroids but the ceiling of anabolic activity seems to be lower so when people use SARMs they do not gain as much muscle as when they use anabolic steroids and oftentimes in their quest for achieving a similar muscle building outcome the higher and higher the dosage gets, the less selective it becomes. So almost like certain, I don't know, beta blockers, for example, as you get higher and higher, they become less receptor selective and you get more like broad spectrum, you know. What do, what are the typical SARMs or what are the most potent or commonly used SARMs? LGD4033, probably. It's called a ligandrol. It was actually, it's, these compounds often get traded around companies so often that they have new code names every time I check. I think the most recent one was I think it turned into VK5211 by Viking Therapeutics was the last company I'm aware of who had it. And it was in, I think, a phase two trial for hip hip fracture patients. Osterine, also known as Enobos arm, was probably the most well-known SARM, but it has not been FDA approved and seems to have not hit their target endpoints that they wanted, although it looked effective. And oftentimes women who are trying to achieve like a physique to step on stage to try and like bridge the gap between not using anything and using steroids they will go for something like an osterine and they don't viralize themselves when they take it yeah I, it's funny i always thought that was a serm i didn't know it was a serm these are um are these banned compounds in yeah. natural bodybuilding yeah so they're considered and they're super detectable because they're not supposed to be in your body at all so how does one get these? Are these, if they're in phase two, uh, same way you would get. So it's all underground. But compounding pharmacies, some of them per make them. Yeah, that's true. Crazy. I, I've seen compounding pharmacies make a lot of things. I've heard some wild, nutty stuff. Just like, oh yeah, I'm prescribed Tren. It's like, what do you, how does your pharmacy make Tren? Yeah, let's talk about Tren. Where does that fit into? <laughs> it's, uh, so that's actually classified as a steroidal SARM, interestingly enough. So it was prescribed to women in the 80s, I believe, um, and was also used to beef up cattle and might even still be. Um, but it is super anabolic, but it also has very odd progestogenic activity. So it interacts with the progesterone receptor, causes severe night sweats. It's called trend sweats. It also has this weird side effect called trend cough. No one can be sure of what is causing it, but it's the, one of the only drugs associated with a prevalence of a severe coughing fit, like you're having an allergic reaction or something after you take it. So you inject it and you feel all of a sudden this tightness in your chest. And then within 20 seconds, you're on the floor hacking up a lung for two minutes. I, I had a patient come to me a little while ago who was seeing some fancy doc in LA who had him on a pretty high dose of Tren and GH. That's crazy. And um, again, there's always like, how do you get people off these things? And yeah. luckily he wasn't on it for very long. Those compounds are more suppressive too, because they interact with the progesterone receptor 
significantly. So it's like you get the negative feedback, not just through AR, ER, but PR as well. So let's just kind of recap where you were on some of those. So did you did you talk about DECA and Androlone? And yeah, where DECA it fits? is close to the more pure anabolic side. It'll it's not near you know the selectivity of a SARM at a therapeutic dose, mm -hmm. but it is interestingly enough the only steroid that you can probably use at a dose that is will result in bodybuilder level results without hair loss because it has unique interaction where it's and this is it gets so complicated when you think of the pharmacology of this stuff because it's like it will five alpha reduce into a dihydronandrolone which is almost no androgenic activity so in the muscle where you have a relative absence of 5ar you will retain the anabolic properties of nandrolone where you want it but then in your scalp it'll five alpha reduce into this metabolite dihydronandrolone where it has almost no, no androgenicity activity, yeah. so you get like the muscle building without the hair loss